because we know this is uh, the 400th year anniversary of 29 Africans coming into uh, Virginia there at Point Comfort. African people had been here in this land going back uh, tens of thousands of years. Okay, and if you read the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, by Dr. David M. Hotel, his book fairly documents that history. Okay, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. I interviewed him August 21st, 2019, the day after August 20th. Check out that interview. We have it on Facebook and at our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep as well. We dealt with a, uh, a lot of this history. But uh, what's interesting, and I'm going to do a separate broadcast dealing with this, is that the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory um, we call South Carolina in uh, 1526, okay? And that's not talked about a lot. So this is 93 years before uh, 1619. Okay, so for a number of reasons, even though August 20, 1619 is important to study, for a number of reasons, that's not when we first came here. So why is that still being pushed as when our history started in this country? Okay, if we actually, if we actually understand our history, we, uh, we understand that this was our land stolen from us. If we actually understand our history, this was our land stolen from us. Okay, so why, why is that false narrative still being pushed? And, the, you know, the, the articles they have at the 1619 Project, these are good articles. You know, they have some good articles. Now, most of them don't deal with 1520, uh, don't, don't talk about 1526, and definitely don't talk about the African presence here in this land going back tens of thousands of years. But this is the insert, this is from the New York Times, dealing with the uh, 1619 Project. And it has the, uh, all the articles from the 1619 Project in here as well, at least most of the articles, okay? Uh, and then I've been reading some of them online at, at New York Times, uh, uh, NewYorkTimes.com. But it says here on the front, we've got to tell the unvarnished truth. And that's a quote from uh, John Hope Franklin, who's a historian and author. We've got to tell the unvarnished truth. That's true. So why do you start our history in this country in 1619? Because because we were here we were here for tens of thousands of years. The Khoisan, who have the oldest DNA on the planet, come from southern Africa, go all around the world. They were here going back at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years ago. When you look at the uh, discovery from Dr. Albert Goodyear, uh, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, the discovery he made in two thousand four in Allendale County, South Carolina, they they found thirteen different uh, types of evidence, 13 different types of evidence documenting an African presence in this country going back tens of thousands of years. So why do we start with 1619? And then even when we look at uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr., and even though I disagree with them on some aspects of the way he uh, tells the history, especially dealing with the transatlantic slave trade, you know, he does, he does write some good books, he does write some good articles. I've read dozens of his articles, but he talks about Juan Garrido. So a lot of people have not read this book here. So many people saw the PBS uh, six-part series he did, The African Americans, Many Rivers to Cross. A lot of people don't know that he put out a companion book to that six-part series. Okay, And in, in here, uh, he talks about Juan Garrido, like in pages, uh, was it three? Four? Yeah, page, page three. He talks about Juan Garrido, perhaps one of the best-known and most colorful of the free black conquistadors was Juan Garrido. Born about 1480 in West Africa, Juan Garrido either was sold to Portuguese slave traders or somehow traveled on his own to Lisbon, Portugal, where, uh, where about 10% of the city was of African descent. So he goes on to talk about how uh, Juan Garrido comes into uh, Florida in 1513 with Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador. Okay, this is 1513. This is this is um, before uh, you look. You're looking at uh, 13 years before 1526. Okay, this is 1513. But Juan Garrido is not even talked about. So for a number of reasons, when people talk about uh, uh, we first came to this land in 1619, no, that's not true. We did come here. What happened in 1619 with that white line slave ship and those 29 Africans being traded for 
uh, supplies and water and things like this. That did happen. But that's not when we first came here for a number of reasons. But this is what happens when you don't understand history. It's just like the it's just like the uh, the panel discussion that took place with Killer Mike and Ti and Candace Owens things like this, you know I got to do a separate broadcast breaking that stuff down. Man, there's a whole lot of misinformation in that, you know, because I'm telling you if I had, if I had been on that panel, it'd have been a whole different discussion. First of all, there were not more con we did not have more African Americans in Congress during Reconstruction than we have now. No, there was about 22 in Congress. During Reconstruction, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877, you got 56 now. So so right off the bat, when you say something like that, I'm like, what are you talking about? But see, this, but they, but they should have had a historian. They should have had at least one historian on that panel. This is, this, see, this is, this is one of the problems with some of those panel discussions. People mean well, but you, you don't have the right people on the panel. You need at least one historian. You need like a Dr. Greg Carr, okay? Dr. Like Dr. Greg Carr, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor James Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha the Kamene, okay? You you need a you need a, an economist on that panel, like a Dr. Julian Malvo or Dr. Claude Anderson. You need an economist on the panel, okay? So um, yeah, you know I know people mean well, but it's like, dude, come on, man. Um, but I got to go through, and when you look at Candace Owens, um, Candace has proven, to, she can't, if you look at the, she's proven that she has no clue what she's talking about, has a poor understanding of history, okay? Um, and, I, and somebody posted, you know, one of the clips of it, and I commented on it and went through and showed what was historically inaccurate and things like this. And what I find interesting is when people talk about the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, nobody wants to talk about the Lily White Movement in 1928. It was the Lily White Movement in 1928 that helped push African Americans out of the Republican Party, and that's why we went to the Democratic Party. Because we were being pushed out of the Republican Party, because the Republicans were trying to get Herbert Hoover elected as president during the 1928 presidential election. Herbert Hoover was running against Al Smith. Al Smith was a Northern Democrat. He wasn't a Southern segregationist Dixiecrat. He was a Northern Democrat. The Republican Party implemented a five-state Southern strategy, okay? A five-state Southern strategy to appeal to five former, uh, to, to five Southern states that were former Confederate states to get them to vote for, uh, Herbert Hoover, okay? This was, the, and, and the Lily White, you have to research the Lily White movement of 1928. See, most people, including Reverend Al Sharpton, uh, and I like Reverend Al, I listen to his radio show every day, okay, but he, he, I listen to what he says, and he has a poor understanding of history also. This is not an attack on Reverend Al, but I'm just, I'm just telling you. Um, many people are under the misconception that the reason why African Americans switched over from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party is because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That's largely factually, historically inaccurate because by, by 1960, two-thirds of African Americans had already switched over to the Democratic Party. No, you got to go back 40 years before that, about 40 years before that, to the 1920s. And what was going on in the 1920s? Because you 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 had a rise in the uh, Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was rejuvenated by the movie *The Birth of a Nation*, that came out February 8, 1915. You you uh, had the Great Migration taking place, which starts basically in 1915. 1915 to 1970, six million African Americans migrate from the South up north and out west. It really gets kicked off because of World War I. World War I is 1914 to 1918. So you have African Americans migrating up north, going into uh, Detroit, and Gary, Indiana, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, things like this, moving into the inner cities, dealing with overcrowding, dealing with competition for housing, competition for jobs, dealing, it puts a strain on public services. So African Americans are trying to get our issues and concerns addressed dealing with we're, 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 we're facing racism up north we're facing uh, 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 
disparity when it comes to wages. We're in, in, in many times we're paying twice as much for uh, very poor living conditions. And we're also dealing with an increase in the power of the Ku Klux Klan. So the, so the Klan in 1926, the Klan, they have a, like a rally there uh, in Washington, D.C., in front of the U.S. Capitol building. Okay, so we are we we are trying to get these issues and concerns met by the Republican Party. The Republican Party is increasingly ignoring our issues to appeal to Southern segregationists to get their vote so they can maintain power. All right. So we see the Democratic Party. We start we start slowly going over to the Democratic Party, especially after. Uh, President Roosevelt wins. So we, we see the Democratic Party as being more receptive, in general, more receptive to our issues and concerns. So it's going to happen, that transition happens over the course of going to the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s, over the course of about three decades, and then we go on to 1960. It wasn't all overnight, okay? But it's dealing with who can best address our issues. 1947, um, the uh, the Democrats have a more, um, for, for 1947 and 48, going into that presidential campaign, they have a more pro-civil rights uh, platform. And then you're going to have Strom Thurmond, who was a Southern segregationist Dixiecrat. Strom Thurmond runs for president as a Dixiecrat, Okay. And then it's going to be in 48 that they bring back out that Confederate battle flag that people mistakenly think is the Confederate flag. So the car, the flag that was on the General Lee car on the Dukes of Hazard is not the Confederate flag. That's the Confederate battle flag of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee's army. Okay, there were three flags that flew over the Confederate States of America from uh, 1861 to 1865, the Confederacy. There were three flags. That flag that was on the General Lee car was never one of those flags because that flag is not the Confederate flag. That's the Confederate battle flag of Northern Virginia under General Robert E. Lee's army. But since we don't understand history, you know, we don't, we don't know any of this stuff. So what we're dealing with is that when we look at why, and I'm trying to find the... Uh, my, I got a packet of notes here dealing with this because I, I did a three hour lecture dealing with the history of why we switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Okay? And it's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, and it's a three hour lecture, and I go in depth into all this history, break all this stuff down. And it, 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 so, but but this is what happens. This is an example of what happens when we don't understand history. We keep falling for this nonsense. But Candace Owens is some Candace Owens is someone who doesn't understand the history. And in 2016, she was running a website, and one of the things the website was doing was attacking Donald Trump. So you have to ask the question: What happened? All right. Look at the uh, article from. Look at the article from uh, News1.com. Five times Candace Owens lied to Congress while testifying about white nationalism. Five times Candace Owens lied to Congress about testifying about white nationalism. And then this dealt with the, um, in the House of Representatives, this dealt with the committee hearing uh, on the rise of white nationalism. Okay? And one of the things it talks about here and I'll post this link, you can check this out. Um, one of the things it talks about is when she talked about the Southern strategy is a myth. The Southern strategy is a myth. That's a lie. Candace Owens claimed that black Republicans are mistreated by their Democratic counterparts for having audacity to think for themselves and become educated about our history and the myth of things. Okay, like the Southern strategy which never happened. Okay, uh, Candace Owens, tell me which history books you've read. I listen to you. I don't ever hear you cite history books. Well, which history books did you read? Okay. She said, it, it, she said the, the Southern strategy never happened. No, that's not true. 
the, the Lily White movement in 1928 was a Southern strategy. So this article goes on to say, of course the Southern strategy is a very real thing that has been documented millions of times over uh, millions of times over and was described by History.com as, quote, the Republican Party's successful plan of getting the white Southern population to shift their views from Democratic to Republican. Now, History.com is the official website of the History Channel for those that are not familiar with History.com. Okay? Now, if you... If you uh, follow me, you know I talk about History.com a lot because I read the articles they have there. Mm. All right? And so we'll post this, uh, uh, this link here. This deals with, uh, this is from News1.com, dealing with five times Candace Owens lied. Five times Candace Owens lied to Congress while testifying about white nationalism. And it goes through and fact checks her and shows how what she's saying. Was, was not historically accurate, okay? And what, what I find interesting is also that she still uh, refuses to debate Roland Martin because Roland challenged, challenged her and Charlie, uh, uh, Charlie Kirk, I think it is, Charlie Kirk, or Charlie Chris, who was at uh, Turning Point Communications, okay? He challenged them to a debate. He said, I'll debate both of you at the same time. And Charlie Kirk, that's his name, Charlie Kirk. And uh, they haven't taken them up on that. I wonder why. Let me see, where did I put that? Because I just had... Uh... We'll come to some more of your questions here. I just saw that... Uh... That packet dealing with that history, I just saw it uh, yesterday. So, I don't know where I put it. But yeah, so we th this is why we have to study history. And, and, and a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community okay it's like this same argument going over it's like this whole argument going over undocumented immigrants right this is a very very old argument and what a lot of people don't understand is like if you go back to Herbert Hoover you know I did I did a broadcast dealing with how um, uh, in the 1930s during the Great Depression the U.S. deported 1.8 million people of Mexican ancestry back to Mexico. Okay, 60 percent of them, 60 percent of them were Mexican Americans. Okay, 60 percent of them were Mexican Americans, but they said that these people were taking white people's jobs, so they deported them back to Mexico. This is a very, very old uh, argument very old debate and you have a lot of misinformation and people operating based upon a lot of misinformation but what what people fail to understand is that white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another so the one percent stay in power the same thing happened the same thing happened uh, right after slavery ended and you had or even during slavery, towards the end of slavery, and you had uh, 12 million European immigrants coming to this country. Okay, and they're going to work, and a lot of them going to work in factories with uh, low pay, working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. You don't have child labor laws at this time. Their labor is their labor is being exploited. Okay, because what white supremacy does is it pits groups, it pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another so the one percent stay in power we go back to Bacon's rebellion in 1675 and 1676 in the colony of Virginia it's going to be after Bacon's rebellion that the term white is going to be used in the colonies for the people who we call white people because like when you read before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. you read chapter 2 one of the things he talks about is how it wasn't until the late 17th century, the late 1600s, that the term white was used
for um, the English. They, they were called English or Christians. They, in general, they weren't called white. But because of Bacon's Rebellion, what happened was is that you had European indentured servants who united with enslaved Africans to fight because they had a common oppressor. Okay? This is Bacon's Rebellion. But a lot of us don't understand history. So it's going to be after that that the effort is made to break up that alliance between these poor European indentured servants and enslaved Africans. But what white supremacy does is it pits groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another so the 1% stays in power. If we go look at the U.S. Civil War, people should ask the question, well, during the Civil War, most of the people that fought on behalf of the South to maintain slavery, most of them were not the wealthy plantation owners and slave owners. These were poor white men, most of them. Okay, well, when you read the statements of secession, Mississippi, Texas, things like this. You read their statements of secession. They talk about how slavery was central to maintaining their wealth and maintaining their way of life. So how did the rich, wealthy plantation owner, and you're going to have, you're going to have a few of them fighting the Civil War, but the majority of the men fighting on, on behalf of the South to maintain slavery, most of them didn't own slaves. Most of them were poor. So how did the wealthy plantation owner how did they get them, how did they convince poor white men to go risk their lives in the Civil War to fight for something they did, they did, that they didn't have? They told them if the slaves are free, they're going to take your jobs. But the slaves were already doing your jobs and they were doing it for free. White supremacy pits group, groups of oppressed people against each other to fight one another. They were all, there were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. We were the ship builders, we were the anchor makers, we were the engine builders, we were the blacksmiths, the coppersmiths, the barbers, all of that. There were at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. Okay, if you uh, look at the book, uh, The Other Slaves, by uh, Ronald Lewis and uh, there's one other person here. I talked about this in one of my, my recent broadcasts. Um, they lay out all the skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country from uh, 1619 to 1865, okay? So then after, after the Civil War ends, you're gonna have all these labor unions pop up, okay? And these labor unions uh, like the National Labor Union, you found in 1866. Uh, you're going to have the AFL, American Federation of Labor, 1875, with Samuel Gompers. Samuel Gompers, G-O-M-P-E-R-S. Go, go watch the, uh, go watch the broadcast I did dealing with uh, the African American roots of Labor Day. The African American roots of Labor Day, and I dealt with the um, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Okay, so you know. All those jobs were jobs that we had when we were working for free. We, we were the skilled labor. Now, now, you have white people who were skilled laborers also. That's another thing. To say, that, to say that you didn't have white people who were skilled laborers, that's not true. If you want to say we dominated the skilled trades and like the, we, the majority of the skilled labor was us, okay, that's, that's understandable. But to say white people didn't have skilled labor, no. Because you had European immigrants coming to this country and they had skills also. Uh, but what's going to happen is these labor unions are going to be created to lock us out of the jobs that we were doing for free for 246 years. And then we're going to be locked back into uh, agriculture with the sharecropping system. So, this, see, this is why they needed a historian on that panel. Because I'm telling you right now, if I had been on that panel, it would have it gone differently. Okay? It would have been a different story. Um... 1947, the Democratic Party adopts a more pro-civil rights platform, and Strom Thurmond runs as a Dixiecrat, okay? And just outside the Capitol building, you had the, in 1926, you had the Ku Klux Klan, who had a demonstration, because, see, the Klan was rejuvenated by the movie The Birth of a Nation, 1915. That's why you have to understand the chronology of history. The Klan had pretty much died out by 1915. They were founded December 24, 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. All right, but this movie, The Birth of a Nation, that shows the Klan as being the heroes. The movie is based upon a novel by a man named Reverend Thomas Dixon. The name of the novel was called The Klansman. 
in the in 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 this this um, movie calls race rides in the streets. That's why you have to research the birth of a nation and see how the birth of a nation then ties into World War One, then ties into 1919, which is the year after World War One ended, called the Red Summer. And you had over 25 major race riots in this country. Go back and look at the uh, video I did dealing with the history of the Red Summer. Okay, so we have to understand our chronology of this history. So when we talk about politics, you can't talk about politics without understanding history. This is why the presentation I do at the, um, on the Black Agenda Tour is so important. Because I deal with the intersection of history and politics. Politics is the, is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. And the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties. Their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. And we have to understand how movements take place in response to conditions. Laws and policies are put in place to address the issues that the movements were created to address then those laws and policies that are put in place to address the movements then create conditions then movements take place to address the conditions that the laws created so you have a cycle but you have to understand how all of this intersects because slavery was law in this country and sanctioned by the US Constitution alright so um, so check out the uh, 6 DVD black migrations bundle pack because the, my presentation dealing with the history of why African Americans switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party is in that. It's one of those six DVDs also. So that's on sale. That six DVD bundle pack is on sale um, $50. Uh, and it also includes six principles of political self defense. Uh, now, the, in, in the version I do at the Black Agenda Tour, it's, it's, it's going to be a little different because uh, each one I do uh, on this tour is a little different than the previous one, okay? And, uh, you know, I address certain things that uh, take place there at the conference, certain things that uh, uh, happen in the news as well. All right. So let me post this again here. All right, but this is why, you know, the history and culture is so important. The people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. And... Um, you know, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. It's our history and culture that gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This, in, this influences how we see ourselves. This gives us our self-esteem, our self-development, our self-worth. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. It influences our economic empowerment and, and our political empowerment. It, 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 you have a, a, a synthesis of all of this. This all intersects. So it's not just one thing. It's not just African history and culture and learning Medunetter and trying to metaphysically transport ourselves to 3000 BC in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. It's not just having economics and you're just talking about wealth creation because we can all have stock portfolios valued at $5 million and we can still spend 97% of our dollars with people that don't look like us because that foundation is not in place and you can still, you can still be wealthy and hate yourself. We can look at entertainers and athletes and, and, we, and we can see that they hate themselves. I just talked about um, uh, Lil' Kim and uh, the 2000, the year 2000 interview that Lil' Kim did with Newsweek, Newsweek.com, Newsweek Magazine, called a, a whole lot of Lil' Kim. And she talked about how she had low self-esteem. She talked about uh, how, the, how the divorce between her parents affected her. Uh, she talked about how uh, her boyfriends would always cheat on her with women that had European-looking features. Okay? So when she gets some money, what does she do? She gets breast implants, she gets blue eye contacts, she gets blonde hair. And then uh, in 2016, we saw images she posted of herself on Instagram and with very, very light skin. She, did, she didn't look like the same little Kim that we saw back in 96. Okay, so we have, we, have to, we have to understand this. You have to have a synthesis of this. And um, it's not, it's, you know, wealth creation and economic empowerment are not the same thing. Okay, we have to understand the difference between them. Economic empowerment comes when you own the land in your community, you own, you 
own the businesses, you control the economics, you own the gas stations, the grocery stores, the radio stations, the TV stations, the dry cleaners, you can employ your people, you, you know, you grow your food, you own the land, you, uh, you own the office buildings, the, uh, the car washes, this is economic empowerment, okay? Wealth creation, you can have 401ks and you can have Roth IRAs, um, you can have a $5 million stock portfolio, right? But you can still be spending 97% of your dollars with people who don't look like you. You have wealth creation. We, I'm not against wealth creation, but we have to transform that wealth into economic empowerment. Those are two different things. All right, so look, hey, guys, we're going to get out of here. Um, let me see here. What was going to so, so the other slaves, what, what, let me see, where did I have that? The... Uh, I thought I had, because uh, see what happened was that the, the way I found out, the, one of the ways I found out about all the skills, trades, and crafts that we had in this country uh, from 1619 to 1865 is uh, at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History in Detroit. And they have a display. Yeah, here it is right here. They have a display when you go through the main exhibit called, called And Still We Rise. Uh, on the on the wall, they have displayed all these skills, trades, and crafts, and they're listed there, but they're not numbered. And they have a sign there that says you you can't take pictures, right? So I went home, got a pen and pad, came back, and spent an hour writing them down, and I numbered them. That's how I know it's 262. Okay, but it's it's from the uh, the book, the other slaves, mechanics, artisans, and craftsmen. The Other Slaves, Mechanics, Artisans, and Craftsmen from, uh, is written by James E. Newton and Ronald Lewis. James E. Newton and Ronald Lewis from 1978. Okay, so that's how, that's how I know it. And, um, and some of them, let me see, some of them were, let me see if they listed here. Okay, I was trying to see in this book here if they list any of them. In one of these pages, they do. How white folks got so rich. Uh, all right, but yeah, all those uh, skills, trades, and crafts, we had mastered those. All right. Okay, I'll have to find it later. All right, guys, look, hey, we have to get out of here. Uh, if you like this type of information, also, you can donate to the African History Network, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and also at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. Uh, be sure to register for the online course I teach. If you like this type of information, the online course I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school will blow you away and I do a PowerPoint presentation So the presentation is visual uh, We do it online at our online school uh, It's an eight-week 16-hour online course all the sessions are recorded So if you miss anything you can go back and watch it over and over again uh, So it's regularly uh, $130 on sale $80 ancient Kemet the Moors and the Ma'afa Understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so we'll post the link here we, So we do that class Thursdays 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time and as soon as you register you can watch classes 1 through 4 and then there's about 36 hours of bonus content also, okay? Um, all right Okay, African American business owners, email us at customer service at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And if you want to learn about uh, investing in the stock market, uh, trading, uh, stocks, options, futures, the foreign exchange market, day trading, uh, visit TheProfitRoom.com. TheProfitRoom.com can help you with that. They are an education company that has mentorship programs that are designed for uh, beginners, okay? And one of the things they specialize in is one-on-one -on -one mentorship and day trading also. Visit theprofitroom.com. 
All right, guys, we've got to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, what you allow other people to do to you and, and get away with. It's based upon what you think about yourself. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.